Actually, come on. No, they're not. All, all the lights are on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> right. So, uh, sorry, Penka. I will not repeat what I said yesterday. Uh, so, I, um, I will just continue where where I ended up yesterday. And uh, remember, for the existence result for Stein structures, there there was two steps. Uh, First, one needs to extend an integrable complex structure over the handle, and then one needs to extend a j-convex function over the handle. And I started explaining the second step. So, so I will continue that and then move to the first one. So suppose that, so, so what we already convinced ourselves of yesterday was that it, what we re it all comes down to constructing just a one j convex hypersurface on on a standard handle where this is real r k and this is r to n minus k in c n with a standard complex structure uh, we want to construct one j -co i convex hypersurface which is going over the handle like this so, and it should be co-oriented this way. So, so this is uh, the goal, sigma i convex. Okay. And once we have that, then by the max construction, we can construct a, a, a j convex function on, on the handle, which extends a given function down here. So, so the, the hypersurface sigma should match level sets of some standard function down here, so we can implant it uh, in uh, in our manifold, and and then bend around like this. Okay. So let me first introduce uh, just some coordinates to describe this situation. So so let's say uh, coordinates here are z j is x j plus i y j. Those are complex coordinates on Cn. And let me introduce the norm in the Rk direction as capital R. <laughs> Who are that? So actually, I think I'm, I'm used to drawing pictures such that, such that this is the imaginary direction. So, so this is y1 square all the way up to yk square. And little r is all the other coordinates. So it's uh, x1 square plus xn square plus yk plus 1 square plus yn. And then if we look at uh, the function phi standard, which will just de depend on these two parameters, uh, which is a little r square minus capital R square for some constant a, then it's, it's easy to see that if a is bigger than 1, this function is going to be i-convex. Yeah. So, so, so you, you see this function, is, is this is a quadratic function, and it is decreasing in, in k direction, and it's, it's increasing in uh, the other directions. And, and if the to check i convexity, you look at every complex pair, uh, say x1 and y1, and now it's decreasing in the y1 direction. It's increasing in the x1 direction, but it's increasing faster in the x1 direction, and and the average is hence positive, uh, and uh, this 
this is precisely I convexity. Yeah? So uh, of course, I mean, this you can just compute and take it as yeah. If you don't like the geometric picture. Yeah, then you couldn't do that, right? Yeah, then then you couldn't do that. So so this this is a level set. So let's say down here, this is a level set where this standard function is equal to, I guess, mm, equal to minus one. That's the level set that, that would continue through here, if this is minus one. Yeah. So so this is one level set of the standard function. We want sigma to match that level set and then bend around and. So and we will find this hypersurface also as being described just in terms of these two coordinates, which is nice because it brings uh, down to uh, just two variables. So we will describe sigma. In fact, and in fact, we will write sigma basically as a graph where capital R is some function phi of little r. Now, now this phi is not a j-convex function here, so maybe I shouldn't use the same. But now, now this is just some function describing a hypersurface in Cn. Yeah? Can you say that what the level set of minus one was? Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's this, this level set. Which, which, which is continue, continuing like this here. Yeah? It's a level set of a, of a quadratic function. But then we need to deviate here and, and bend it around. But also same thing on the top, Yeah, same thing on the top. This is, this is also part of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. So, so if I draw this just in, now I can draw pictures just in uh, these coordinates. R and capital R. And I want to construct a hypersurface which up here, now, now you need to, yeah, you need to look at this upper quadrant just. Yeah? So, so we want a hypersurface which, which looks like the standard quadratic function. Let me maybe draw it here. So it should match this one. And then it should deviate and it should bend down. And when I'm saying it's a graph, it will actually become vertical. Yeah, so, so never mind, but it's uh, still, yeah? So, so the slope becomes infinity here. So this is what uh, the hypersurface should look like. Yeah? OK. So, so now. Now one needs to make some rather lengthy computation and compute. If you describe a hypersurface like this, then you compute what is the condition for this hypersurface to be i-convex. Yeah. So sigma is i-convex. Well, you can compute exactly what it is, but it's getting some getting surprisingly complicated. So it's, in fact, determined by two second-order differential inequalities. So I'm not going to write those down, but I'm going to write down some, necessary, uh, some sufficient condition for i-convexity, which is simpler, which you can extract from that. So it's sufficient for i-convexity that the following, and this I cannot. Uh, at some moment, I, I knew it by heart because we were using it so often, but now not any longer. So it's this. This inequality phi double prime plus phi prime cube over r minus one over phi one plus phi prime square should be greater or equal to zero. Okay. So this is. Nice, right? So it's, a, it's some differential inequality for a function of one variable, and you just need to solve it. And, and surprisingly, this is not entirely easy. Yeah? Well, OK, it doesn't look so bad, but uh, OK. So, uh, so there was, 
One great simplification brought into this picture by Michael Struve at ETH when uh, Jascha Lerschberg lectured on this. He had some very complicated construction of such things and then Struve listened to that and the day later Struve came back and, and uh, wrote down a differential equation which had this marvelous property that first you can solve it and second the solution automatically satisfies this differential inequality. Okay. So it's, uh, okay. I was absolutely amazed. So, uh, so this is uh, true. Uh, no, I think I think there's just some incredible smartness behind that. And uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think I think there are people who just stare at this differential inequality and realize you make it some differential equation. And uh, yeah. Okay, so so I, I'm going to write down this differential equation. So it's uh, Struve's. Differential equation is uh, phi double prime plus yeah. you want to sup and sup solution for both of us. So you add this. Uh huh. So this. Yes. I think that must be the trick though. Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> so this is it. So so you just uh, forget about this term, and you uh, throw in a factor of of two here, and and look at this differential equation. Okay. So so now now you see the. This is a, just a first order differential equation in the derivative, so, so you can actually integrate it. Yeah? So, so let, me, let me just do it. So, so this is equivalent if I integrate it once to saying that 1 over 5 prime square is equal to logarithm of r over delta, where delta is some integration constant. Yeah, so I just, just integrated. Uh, and uh, get a solution for phi prime. And then you need to integrate once more. So you solve for phi prime and integrate this uh, to get a solution of phi. And now then you just need to study what this solution looks like. But already what you see from, from this uh, form here is that it is already starting out correctly because at delta, uh, the derivative becomes infinity. And then for r bigger than delta, it's finite. Yeah? So, so already, this is a solution. It starts at some, uh, we still have a uh, choice of uh, constant where, where it starts. And then it starts with slope infinity, and, it, and it's bending around. Yeah? So, so this, uh, this is already having roughly the correct shape. So this is uh, at, at delta, we have slope infinity. So, so let me just do this. And now, now it turns out you can do the following. You can uh, pick any linear function here. So r is, let's say you pick this equal to 1. 1 plus d times little r. d is some constant greater than 0, but otherwise it can be arbitrarily small. And then you can adjust the, the remaining free constant in such a way that you have a solution which starts out at a value above this linear function. And then it, its approach, well, sorry, I should be a bit more careful. So it starts out at slope infinity. It's always moving upwards, but then eventually it hits this one at some place. OK? So, so this is uh, hitting somewhere. It turns out you can make the whole thing very small because we need to make the whole handle also arbitrarily thin if we want to implant it somewhere. So, so maybe there's here some parameter gamma which we need to and say this is one. This is some fixed size and this we want to also be able to make small in, uh, so, so we can use that model. Yeah? So, so we can, you can do it so that this is so small it's below gamma. The delta just comes, this is just the first integration constant. Yes? 
So, so this delta is still at our disposal. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the gamma, and uh, say the gamma is somewhere here. And then uh, there's actually a second constant coming in. So one is delta, and there's a second integration constant, which you can choose. And this determines how far out you are. So the way, one way to describe it is that this is going up to some k times delta, and k is the second constant you get from integration. And, and then you're going to make delta very small, in fact, and you need to make k rather large, but by making delta very small, you can make k delta still smaller than any given gamma. So, so it's, it's some playing around with constants. And if you choose delta and k appropriately, then the solution of this differential equation satisfies the differential inequality. So it defines a, an iconvex hypersurface. Okay? And, and it has roughly the correct shape. Now, the only thing missing, this does not yet uh, match the quadratic function outside. Yeah? So, so what, what do we <coughs> do about that? Let me redraw the picture here. So we have already a function. So we have a linear function going up like this. Then we have our solution, which connects with this linear function. And now we have the quadratic function to which we want to match it. So the quadratic function is doing something like this. Yeah? OK? So uh, unfortunately, you, you could try and just continue this solution un until it hits the quadratic function. But, but this doesn't work. So you cannot go as far as you would need to to connect to the quadratic function. So that's the first idea which fails. The second idea is. Well, maybe you, you just connect it here to the, to the linear function, then follow the linear function from here to here until it hits the quadratic function, and then follow the quadratic function. And uh, here's where Helmut's uh, whatever subsolutions come in. So if you have one solution and another solution, you can take the, the, what is it? the maximum of the two graphs, and that's still going to be iconvex. This is a version of the maximum construction I explained last time for iconvex functions. You can also take these functions these whose graphs we have, and you can just take a maximum of this. This is iconvex. Yeah? Uh, so, so in principle, if this bit is iconvex here, is, if this bit is iconvex there, and, and that is iconvex anyway, because of the standard function, you can just go like that. Yeah? OK, that's the second attempt, which is already uh, better, but uh, still doesn't work. Because it turns out this is iconvex up to here, up to the place it hits. The linear function is iconvex here. The quadratic function is iconvex. But somewhere in here, the linear function fails to be iconvex. This is only iconvex up to a certain point. Okay? And, uh, and, and that, that point, we were getting a little bit worried. Yeah? Um, and uh, now it turns out you can follow, the <laughs> if you introduce one more different kind of function, then, then you uh, can actually do it. Yeah? So, so you introduce a, a fourth type of function. So you follow the linear function a little bit. And then, and then you take another function, uh, which I'm not going to write down, which then goes from here to here and is iconvex. And you can use it to connect. And then you, then you just piece these things together. Yeah? So, so this is actually where, where a lot of uh, detailed work is. And, uh, I'm, I'm still wondering whether there is not maybe a, a just a much easier way of doing this because it's it's rather lengthy. The whole construction takes up some 20 pages, really, if you put everything together. Yeah. Um, but but in the end, you you find this function. So it's going from here to here to here to here, and uh, you smoothen the corners, and then you have your desired uh, iconvex hypersurface. This is roughly how the, how the construction works. Any questions on that? Do you think it's, it's so complicated because you don't expect a transition condition? What? No, it's <laughs> so complicated because the, the sufficient condition appears not to be enough to construct these interpolations. So, so for, the, for the yellow one, 
the sufficient condition is good. So it satisfies the sufficient condition, and that, that is fairly easy, the sufficient condition. Now it turns out for, for these other shapes in between, they do not satisfy the sufficient condition. So you need to get to the much more complicated <laughs> sufficient and necessary condition. But this is two differential inequalities, and, and both of them much more, much more complicated. And, and you actually have to work with those. Yeah. So, um, right. so we didn't see how to do everything just with the sufficient condition. That's, that's what made it complicated. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's again a version of the statement for uh, j convex functions. You have a continuous j convex function, you can smooth it to make it j convex. And you can just apply this here, and it, and it comes down to you can smooth the corners here. Mm -hmm. OK, so I think this is uh, probably uh, what I want to say about this construction of uh, iconvex functions. So, so this would then, if you put everything together, take care of step two. So once we extended complex structure over the handle, then we can also extend our j convex function over a handle. OK. Yes. Yes. Shall I write it? I can. I can. It's a, it's a function q of r. Is it's actually just some quadratic, mm, some quadratic polynomial. So it's some constant b plus c r square for some appropriate uh, parameters b and c so so this is not the so so this is not the standard function remember this here was a level set of the equation r square sorry minus r square plus a little r square is equal to minus 1 which means that this function is given by r is uh, square root of 1 plus a r square. Yeah? If you, so it's, uh, this is not, not the quadratic function. It's a quadratic function with a square root. And here you take an honest quadratic function. I think actually we'd probably take this to be 1 also. But then some coefficients. And again, this is a function which is i-convex somewhere, but not everywhere. And, and you need to carefully estimate that it is i-convex in that part where you want to follow that function. No. In fact, you can, you can start out fixing a value of a. Yeah. So, well, in f honestly, in the proof, we actually choose a fairly large. But then after the fact, we can show that then you can interpolate back to any given a. So, so the construction, in the end, works for, for arbitrary a, as, lo as long as it's bigger than 1. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the, the, con the, the entries, I mean, for, for the, they do not show up in this step? No, no, they don't show up in this step. This step works in any dimension, also in, also in dimension 4. It's not linear, it's, it's, I mean, it, con, because, because it's, I mean, the, the, way, the way this function describes the hypersurface is in terms of these strange coordinates. So, so it's, not, it's not true even if a function is geometrically convex here when you draw it, that it describes an i-convex hypersurface. This is not true anymore. Yeah, so, so you, you, yes, you cannot really see it geometrically, but just by looking at the function, yeah. I, I told you, if, if you have, a function on Cn, which is geometrically convex, is also i-convex. That is true. But this, this is not it. This, so it's describing some hypersurface in terms of some strange coordinates. And then you cannot really see it. So being convex is not enough to, to describe an i-convex hypersurface. Yeah. Right. OK. Then, then uh, let me move to step two. Step one, yes. Right. Okay, 
So, so we want to extend a complex structure over over a k-handle. where k is less or equal to n. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so let me first describe the, the setup. So we have um, some, suppose down here we already constructed everything and I'm doing the inductional step to extend the complex structure over the next handle. So, so remember we start out with some manifold with an almost complex structure. Now I'm ignoring what we constructed below. I'm viewing it as a cobordism, just saying that near the negative boundary, we already have everything, and we want to extend it. So, so now we have this cobordism, and J is an almost complex structure on that cobordism. And near the, near the negative boundary, let me just, just one second. So near the negative boundary in the neighborhood of this, we have J integral already. Was that a question now? Uh, OK. Yeah. And also, let me call this del minus of w, the negative boundary. Del minus of w is also j convex. Because we constructed this, this was a level set of a j convex function, which we already had. Now, and now in this uh, cobordism, we have an a stable manifold of the next critical point. So we have some, some critical point here, and we have some, some disk, some k-dimensional disk, which is, uh, for me, I'm, I'm thinking of the positive gradient flow. So it's a stable manifold flowing into the critical point, into the index k critical point yeah, of a MOS function. So, so this is, uh, we, we can parameterize this by a map from the, the k-dimensional standard disk. And again, I'm viewing this as the unit disk sitting in Rk, sitting in Cn. Okay. It's a real disk sitting in Cn. And now, now I want to explain, first of all, some homotopical obstruction. So what we have here is then uh, f is a map from the k-dimensional disk and its boundary to w, and it's mapping the boundary into the negative boundary of, of w. Right? Yes? No, we have, we have j everywhere as an almost complex structure, but, and it's integrable at the bottom. So, so what, I, what, I, what I want to by do, yes, by inductive assumption, yes? It's already integrable here. So what I want to do, and it's important that we, that we have an almost complex structure to start with. Hmm? It's, it's the handle, yes. But I, I just chose to call it uh, W now because it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. w, w is the cobordism. This is, uh, the co yeah, W is the cobordism. And I just ignore the part below which I constructed before. I just call this cobordism W. Yes. Okay. So, so what I want to do is I want to deform this almost complex structure through all those complex structures to make it integrable in a neighborhood of this disk. This is the, this is the goal. OK? Yeah? OK? So, so th and, and I want to apply some H principles. So let me maybe write the, the data that you need to check for an H principle. No, the disk is not totally real. And so, so what I want to do is, in fact, I want to make this disk totally real. And then afterwards, once, once the disk is totally real, 
then we will see that we can um, make J integral. So the main, uh, the main step is, in fact, making this disk totally real. But it's nothing. It's, it's not totally real at all. Yeah? So, so we want to make it totally real. So first, No, k okay, is less or equal to n. Yeah, doesn't uh, just any? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, so uh, if we take the differential of f, then this. At every point, the differential defines a, a linear map, an injective linear map from the tangent space of the disk into the tangent space of W. Now, let me, let me for the sake of argument, assume I trivialized all the, all the bundles. So, so I can just, just write linear maps from Rn to Cn, and I can view linear maps by elements of a Stiefel manifold, so a linear map from Rk into Cn is just a k frame in Cn. Because if, if I take the, the standard basis vectors of Rk and their images, that those determine the linear map. And this is a, this is a k frame in Cn. OK? So, so, and so, so assuming all bundles are trivialized, which you can, which you can do by, uh, by making it standard somewhere. And then, yeah, OK, let, let me not get into that. So, so then this is a map. To at every point of the disk, the differential gives me a k frame in Cn. So it's, this is the Stiefel manifold, which I will write as v to n comma k. This is k frames in R to n. Yeah, just real k frames in R to n. Not, I mean, yeah, just k frames in R to n. And and on the boundary, this is not mapping into R to n, but it's mapping into R to n minus 1 into the tangent space of the boundary, which I also trivialize in the relative part. Yeah? So it's, uh, and it's, it's mapping the boundary into the tangent space. So it's, it's a k minus 1 frame in v to n minus 1. Yeah? So, so what we get here is an element in pi 2 of v to n k and v to n minus one k minus one. Uh, uh, sorry, pi, pi k, yeah, pi k. <coughs> and now there's a there's also a Stiefel manifold of of complex frames in C n. Yeah. Or which is the same as saying in R to n this is this is totally real k frames because a totally real k frame is the same as a complex basis, yeah. So uh, so there's a map from the Stiefel manifold v n k complex. So this is complex k frames in C n, yeah. Or as I said, the same as totally real k frames in R to n, mm. and. Uh, and then I can, on the boundary, I can take complex k frames in Cn minus 1, uh, k minus 1 frames. And there's natural inclusion maps of pairs, and they induce a map between homotopy groups. <laughs> yes, so, so, so on the boundary, so on the boundary what, what this would mean is I'm, I'm also trivializing the contact distribution in the boundary. So the boundary is j convex, as I explained yesterday but failed to say, a j convex hypersurface, I said the, this, there's this distribution psi on it. The hyperplane distribution in j convex precisely means this is a contact distribution. So, and, and now I'm, I'm taking linear maps which map uh, the boundary of the disk, so k minus 1 vectors, into Psi, 
So xi is a complex n minus 1 dimensional space. This is Cn minus 1. OK? This is how to think about it. Yeah? So, so this, this is what you would get uh, by taking the differential of, a, uh, of an isotropic embedding, embedding tangent to the context structure. Yeah? But so far, uh, this is nothing about honest isotropic embeddings. This is just bundle theory here. Yeah? OK? But, but this is where it comes from. So, so we have this map. And now just a computation of homotopy groups shows that this map is, in fact, surjective. So, no, OK, you just compute homotopy groups of Stiefel manifolds. Yeah, so uh, um, so you, uh, you have that this map is surjective. And hence, you can, you can lift uh, the, this map to here. So in other words, this, this map here is homotopic to a map which is in here. So df, df defines an element in here, and you can homotope it to, a, to an element which, which is in here by a homotopy, which I will call capital FT. Yeah? So these are just bundle maps. They're, they're, they're not honest embeddings or anything. It's just bundle maps. OK. Now, now this is, yes? No? No, I, I'll come to that. Right. Be patient. <laughs> no, this is, this is still true. Uh, for any n, yeah, k less or equal to n. This is crucial, but this is true for any n. Hmm? So, so this this situation is uh, precisely the homo the homotopical condition to apply an H principle for totally real emerged or totally real embeddings. So, um, you have an embedding which is not totally real. It's and and it's differential. It is not totally real, but the differential can be homotoped to a, a bundle map which is totally real. Yeah? And is also doing the right thing in the boundary. And then there's an H principle which tells you that the original embedding can be isotoped through embeddings to a totally real embedding. Okay? This, is a, this is a version of the H principle for totally real embeddings. Which says that. F, let's say this is uh, F0, is isotopic through embeddings to F1. And F1 maps dk into uh, w, del mine w. And this is totally real. Okay. And and all these and all these embeddings they are always transverse to the boundary. So so uh, maybe I should draw it here. So this is f f zero, and then you homotope, and f one is something which is totally real and still transverse to the boundary. It's not becoming tangent to the boundary. So it's, uh, Okay. C zero close. Yeah. But the tangent direction has to change a lot. Yeah. But you can always keep it C zero close. Mm -hmm. So. So now, once we have this, now we can, uh, now we can extend the complex structure. So, so we take F one. This is a totally real embedding. Is that H principle in homotopy? No. But it can be deduced from, H, from Gromov's H principle. But it's not stated in this way, so it takes another page of, of argument to deduce it. But you don't really have to prove a new H principle. It, it follow, formally follows from Gromov. But it's not exactly stated like this. Because this is some relative version with this boundary, and this is not stated. But uh, it uh, formally follows from it. So now, first of all, if, if I look at the boundary, 
then the boundary is mapping into this uh, hypersurface. And as I said, near this hypersurface, J is integrable. So I have a real analytic structure on the target manifold, and, and I can uh, talk about maps being real analytic. So, so now I'm perturbing the map F1, which I have here, to make it near the boundary, make it real analytic. So F1 to make it real analytic. near the boundary. Yeah? And you, can, you can always approximate a smooth map arbitrarily close, uh, C infinity close, by a real analytic one. So, so then, now, and what, now once you have a real analytic map, you can complexify it to a holomorphic map of a, of a small neighborhood. And so then you extend it to a map which I maybe call F1 tilde, which goes from, from a little neighborhood of the k-dimensional disk in Cn. So it's the disk times the 2n minus k-dimensional disk of some sufficiently small radius epsilon. So this is a neighborhood of the k-disk uh, into w. Which, which near the boundary of this k-dimensional disk is holomorphic. Yeah. So now this is defined on, on an open subset of Cn, and you can, you can make this holomorphic. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you know that any real analytic map you can complexify to a holomorphic map. Essentially, you just write down power series and use them as complex power series. Yeah, so this is nothing very deep that you can do that. OK, and uh, so now, now we take We push forward. Now, here we have a complex structure. This is a subset of Cn. So we have the complex structure I, the standard integrable complex structure on Cn. Now, you push forward this complex structure under the map, yeah? under this diffeomorphism. So, so it's, 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 uh, it's still an embedding. Yeah? You push it forward under this embedding. So on, a on, on the image, you get some, some new integrable complex structure. So we precisely get on the image of this new one. This was F1. Yeah? We thicken it slightly, then push forward. So on a neighborhood of the image, now we get an integrable complex structure, which matches the, the given one down here, because here the, the map was holomorphic. Yes. Okay. So we so we have we have precisely extended the the integral complex structure from here to one on a neighborhood of this totally real disk, and now you want to still inter extend the in this integral one outside this neighborhood to match it with the given one outside some slightly larger neighborhood, and this you can do because now you have two complex structures, the, the original one, J, and the new integrable one near a disk. And this disk is totally real for both of them. And then, then you can essentially linearly interpolate between these two. So here it's uh, becoming important that it's totally real. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you can interpolate to the almost complex structure, just as almost complex structure. So this is, this is just bundle theory. Just interpolate to the given almost complex structure outside some, some larger neighborhood. And, and also what you obtain, you can check, is homotopic to the original almost complex structure. Then. Yeah. So, so this, is, uh, this is the construction. And so far, 
still file for n equals 2. Yeah. So, so, yes. OK. Very good question. Yeah. So I was, I was slightly cheating here. So, so what we actually do is we, we first extend everything from Rk to a little neighborhood of Rk in Rn. So to make it n-dimensional. Yeah? So everything I said is completely correct if k is equal to n. And if it's less, then we first extend it to a little neighborhood of Rk in Rn. And then we complexify, and then we do all the rest. Uh, yeah? so, so then, but you, you are right. If, we, if you don't do it uh, in this way, then, then you run into trouble here. Because then you still have some, some complex normal bundle, and on that normal bundle, things might look different. And uh, so, so you really make it half dimensional first. And, and then everything is determined. You see, if you have a totally real submanifold, then J is completely determined because everything is, is turned out. And then you can interpolate between any two. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It wouldn't, be true for it wouldn't be true for larger k, right? I think maybe for a little bit larger k. I think this is not not quite borderline. Pro, I think. Well, anyway, uh, sorry, sorry. No, no. Yes. So the right hand side makes some sense, but the left hand side only makes sense if k is okay. less or equal to n. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now. So, so it seems like uh, this would be, we would be done with step one, yeah? Uh, with step one, right. Okay, now, now, now it's integrable everywhere. Why? Because uh, now, now you, you take a little neighborhood of this thing, and this is diffeomorphic to the whole thing. So, so you just uh, apply a diffeomorphism to to make this equal to the whole thing, and then it's integrable everywhere. Yeah? So, but not actually interpolating to k. So, yeah, it, uh, yeah. at this inductional step, uh, it depends how you want to phrase it. Either you can say, we keep this j just the same, and we homotope it. But, but, but in fact, you can, you can homotope j uh, to make it integrable everywhere. Yeah? By first, first make it integral in this neighborhood, and then you, then you expand that neighborhood until it covers everything. There's still a, a homotopy of almost complex structures, uh, and at the end, it's integrable everywhere, if you want. Yeah? So it's fixing the boundary? No, it's not fixing the boundary. So, so if you want to further continue, yeah, but uh, it's not fixing the boundary. But yes, how do we attach the next one, right? So, so what you then you, you homotopy to make it integrable everywhere here. And above, slightly above, you undo the homotopy and match it with the j which you already had on top of that. Yeah? And then, then you have a j which is integral everywhere here, and it extends all the way upwards, so you can do the next step. No, but this is a good point. It's important that you always keep track of this, uh, this homotopy class of j, because you need it. Otherwise, you might run into just homotopical obstructions of extending uh, j over the next handle. It's important you already have it as an almost complex structure. So you want to keep that, yeah? Okay. Okay. So, um, so this extends the complex structure, and now we we extend the j-convex function, and we're done. And uh, something is not right yet, because I promised you it will only work if n is bigger than two. Yeah. So where does this come in now? Um, So, so now we have, we, we constructed a complex structure, which is a standard structure on the handle. And to apply our construction of j-convex functions, we need to be able to arrange that the boundary that we have, if you pull it back to, to the standard handle, then it looks like the level set of 
of this standard uh, function that we had uh, in step two. Yeah? This is given by phi standard is equal to minus one. This was, this was the function, this was the standard function to which we, from which we can uh, construct our j-convex hypothesis. So, so we have a level set of this standard function and then we can, then we can somehow bend it around and construct a j-convex function. Yeah? Okay, so, so now a priori, of course, there's no reason that it should, should look like this. So this is the last thing that one needs to arrange. Now let's just look at this situation. What does it mean? So if, if we have this, if it looks like this, then here we have the k-dimensional disk, the core disk of the handle. And if you look at the boundary of this core disk, then you see, well, if we have that, then for this we need that the boundary of this disk is a subset of, of this level set. And it must be uh, tangent to the contact distribution. Because in this model, if you, if you take a level set of this function, then, then you just compute that the boundary of, of this uh, disk in the center is tangent to the contact distribution on this level set defined by this function. Okay? So, so if you want to have any chance of matching it with this model, then, so or maybe going back to this other notation, f or f1 of uh, this boundary here must, must be isotropic. Isotropic meaning tangent to psi, tangent to the contact distribution. And it turns out, once you have arranged that, you, that the boundary is tangent to the contact distribution, then in fact you can, you can modify it slightly uh, further to really match this model. So, so this is some technical part which I will not explain. But the crucial point is first to make it isotropic. Yeah? No, it's not. Well, it, it was just, no. No, this was, this was just the part of the manifold that I constructed beforehand. It has some boundary. The boundary is j-convex. That's all I know. And I attached a handle extended complex structure over the handle. Now I can pull back everything to Cn, to the standard model in Cn. I pull back this hypersurface down there, and a priori I don't know anything. So, so when I pull it back, it will not look like uh, this here. Yeah, it will look something else. But I claim I can, I can then adjust it to, to equal this one, provided that to start with, this, this boundary was isotropic. Then, then I can do some further adjustment to ranges. So this is not very difficult. And, uh, so yeah, exactly. Before you go pull it back to the handle, then there's no phi standard. Yeah, it's some abstract manifold. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so which means we need to improve this H principle, which I'm raising. So that we can, and, and this is really the last ingredient of the proof. So the last ingredient is, is then to to improve this H principle to, to make this disk totally real, but also the boundary isotropic. Yeah? So, so how, does, how does that work? So, uh, so let's, let's look at this, the boundary map. So I'm just going, switching back to the original F. So, I, so this is a map from the K minus one dimensional <laughs> sphere into into this level set. So this level set is 2n minus 1 dimensional. Yeah? And <coughs> j convex. convex. So it has a context structure. So, so this last step is pure contact topology. So, so maybe I call this uh, sigma 
just just some contact manifold like this. Okay, and what we what we have from the previous H principle, uh, we we have seen that we can formally homotope it. We had this uh, with this homotopy of bundle maps of this one to bundle maps which become totally real. If we restrict this to the boundary, we get some homotopy. Let me call it G. Let's try to stick to my notation. Yes, G sub T to so so I'm 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 in mean D G. The differential can be homotoped uh, to G one, which which is um, isotropic. This is what the, the previous H principle says. It's it's totally real. It's mapping into into the contact planes. Just just the linear the linear map. Yeah. This this comes back to the question you asked. Why you had k frames in C n minus one. C n minus one is the contact distribution, and I can push it to map into the contact distribution, the bundle map. Yeah. So so G one, right, is is isotropic mapping into into the contact distribution. Now, this is again the formal setup for an H principle. So there is an H principle for isotropic immersions. So there's an H principle for isotropic immersions, which says that G, let's say this is G naught, is homotopic through immersions. to G1, which is an isotropic emulsion. Okay. Now, if I can replace the word immersion by embedding, then we're done. This is what we need. We need to homotopy through embeddings. Why do we need to homotopy? OK, so why do we need an isotopy of embeddings because we attach a handle along, uh, along the images. So if we change the attaching sphere by an isotopy of embeddings, we always get the same manifold. But if you change it by immersions, then you attach and you get something different. You're just not getting the right manifold anymore. Yeah? So we really need an isotopy of embedding. So, so now if k is less than n, we're in the subcritical case, then you can just perturb this a little bit and make everything embeddings. Just because the dimension, this, this is defined on something uh, k minus 1 dimension, and this is so small, if you just generically perturb it, everything becomes an embedding. You, you need to be a bit careful to keep it isotropic, but you can. Yeah? So then, then, it's, uh, then it's fine. So the interesting case is k equals to n. Now, if k is equal to n, then you can still take the end point of this, g1, uh, and that is still less than half dimensional, so you can perturb a little bit to make it an embedding. You can arrange that, an isotropic embedding. But the homotopy has precisely the, the dimension that you could have intersection points during that homotopy. So if it's, if it's uh, there's an actual invariant, so there's an obstruction to making the homotopy GT an isotopy. Isotopy meaning uh, through embeddings. And uh, I'll finish today by stating this, const this obstruction. This is the following. You define a map, let's call it capital gamma, from interval 0, 1 times s k minus 1 to 0, 1 times sigma, which is 2n minus 1 dimensional, mapping each t and x to t and you take gt 
of x. So you, you make, make this homotopy gt into, into one map with one more parameter into the space. Now you see this is a, okay, now k is equal to n already, yes? So this is n-dimensional, this is n-dimensional. This is now an immersion of an n-manifold in a two n-dimensional space, which near the boundary, 0 or 1, uh, has no self-intersections, because near the boundary you have embeddings. So, so you can count self-intersections in the interior, and you get some count with signs. So there's some invariant, i, gamma, called the self-intersection index. So it's the sum over all intersection points with signs. And this is an invariant which lives in either Z or in Z2. Why? If, if this dimension, which is n, is even, then, then this lives in Z. Because you have, a, you have intersection, you choose some orientation of, uh, of this manifold here. Uh, you have two branches, you orient both of them, and you, count, you, you, you check the sign. Now, you, have, you do not have a particular ordering of the, of the two branches if you have a self-intersection. You don't know which one is first, which one is second. But if the dimension is even, you switch the order, and nothing changes. So you get a well-defined plus-minus sign, and you get a well-defined integer. If the dimension is odd, then picking one order or the other would change the sign, so you only get something well-defined mod 2. Okay? And, uh, and now there's a, there's a theorem of Whitney, and I promised I'll come to the point where n must be bigger than 2, so... Uh, Which, which says that uh, GT can be deformed to GT tilde, an isotopy of embeddings fixed at the endpoints, yeah, to an isotopy of embeddings, if and only if this uh, number is equal to zero. And this if and only if is true for n bigger than two. It is wrong for n equals to 2. Because, because the proof of this is based on the Whitney trick, finding a Whitney disk, and for that you need high dimension. Okay? And, uh, and using this fact, you can, you can then uh, kill the obstruction. And I, want, I will come back to that actually tomorrow because I want to discuss this in some other context. Um, uh, and then you can also, for k equals n, uh, make it an isotopy. And this way you finish the proof. Okay, I need to stop here. Thank you.